The only thing you have to write down is gogoinnovate.com. That's my innovation website. It's not fully functional yet, but it will be. It'll let all of us communicate, if you want to use it, ideas on innovation. Making things better. Every day making the world a little bit better and using imagination. And innovation starts with imagination. So go, go, innovate.com. We can set up conversations you want. There's going to be various chat rooms on various topics of innovation. I've got a picture of Einstein in my office here in Circleville. Imagination is more important than knowledge. You got data, you got that transfers to information, then that becomes knowledge. Now, how do you use that knowledge? No matter what business in, what service you're in. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Now, there's the picture I have in my office, but it's very important. Oops. Einstein, famous formula, equals mc squared. E is energy. M is mass. C is the speed of light squared. So, you take a mass, two masses, you run them together at the speed of light, you create energy, the atomic bomb. This is a very a mind game you can play. What's the difference between simple and simplistic? It will get you think, hi Larry, next door neighbor, right up the road here where all this started. I watched his kids grow up. We watched your kids grow up. Good to see you. Many layers of complexity. And as you go through life, as you go through your businesses, your business development, your congregations, whatever you're doing, you're, you're going to have to deal with levels of complexity, layers of complexity. Learn to deal with it. A couple great books, lay books out about Einstein and how he got to first his special theory of relativity, his general theory of you know, relativity, his unified theory. And it's interesting, after all these years, there was just some recent evidence because of the advancement in scientific in information that it looks like he was right on his unified theory, his general theory. Very interesting. Try it sometime, it'll expand your mind, but it also gives you an idea of the layers of complexity you have to work through. To get the, the atom bomb in World War II, the United States spent over $2 billion and thousands of people out in the desert to develop the atom bomb. Think about, all, thank you, think about all the complexity they had to go through. Start learning how to deal with it, to manage it. And you'll, you'll do that with people. Now, don't get excited. I know there are probably not many math majors in here. I will not expect you to come up with an answer to this math formula, but like algebra, it's a way of handling data. It's a way about thinking things. I sub one is innovation. To get to innovation, you have to take your imagination, I two. You multiply that times people. Things get done through people, and that's how you manage complexity. That's how you innovate. Now you multiply those two together, and you take it to the X. X, again, you can define. I like to, if I really want to do something, I substitute X for N. I mean, that, that's basically, or infinity. How far can you go with this? So dust, when you get home, dust off those algebra books from high school, those calculus books, those chemistry books, those physics books. It brings a new element in, into your thinking, whether it's banking, whether it's a food bank, whether it's, it's religion and health care. There you go. It's on the web, all these slides are on the website. If you want to go back and review, they're in PDF form. If you want to pull them down, use them for your own projects, your own presentations. Best definition I ever heard, and I use it to this day, imagination is the ability to see what's already there. Now let me give you a couple examples. The automobile. The first automobiles in Henry Ford, they put an engine, whether it was steam, whether it was electric, whether the new combustion engines, um, Mercedes, uh, the, the diesel engine, and they put it on a horse carriage. That evolved. The steam train, tracks, the first railroad cars were horse-drawn buckies that they put wheels on that fit on the rails. Think back how that has evolved. Look at the modern-day automobile compared to Henry Ford's production line, uh, 
produced Model T, which left the average man own a car, and how that changed the whole industry. But look at automobiles today compared to that Model T. They didn't do that in one giant jump. It would have been great if we came out with the cars that we have today. Didn't work that way. Years and years of incremental innovation, imagination, engineering, ideas. Steve Jobs, the iPhone. <laughs> remember the bricks? Way back then, this is a young crowd. <laughs> you remember the bricks, right, Larry? The first cell phone, analog, okay. And then Steve Jobs came up with the iPhone. He imagined that. Now, Henry Ford, you know, Henry, my good buddy Henry, did you do market research to come out with a Model T? He says, no need to do market research. If I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Or if they were farmers, a stronger horse. So he just skipped all that. Steve Jobs skipped all that. Favorite phrase, Steve Jobs says the customer doesn't know what they want until they see it. Now think about it. That can apply to you as a pastor, a food bank operator, a businessman, insurance business, factory, a distributor. What does the customer want? Thought for you. You can create a monopoly with service, providing service and things that your competitors can't figure out how to do or don't want to do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about monopolies. When I was, I grew up in the thriving metropolis of Williamsport, Ohio. Everybody know where, who doesn't know where Williamsport, Ohio is? Okay, 10 miles that way on Route 22. Built town of 900 people. I was an entrepreneur from the get-go. By the time I hit the seventh grade, if you wanted a newspaper in Williamsport, Ohio, you had to see me. Okay? Now, not bad for a seventh grader pulling down $7.50. So I learned that monopolies are good when you own them. Now, there's legal ways to create a monopoly, but you have to have a moral, ethical sense about it. And I remember my dad taught Sunday school Shirley Bowser taught my seventh grade catechism class, so I learned about giving, about tithing. And so making seven fifty a week, I'd put three quarters in the collection plate. One day Twyla West came to me, she was the church treasurer, and she said, Gary, are you putting three quarters in the collection plate every day, every Sunday? I said, Yes, I am. She said, Here's your envelopes. That's great for the reinforcing tithing and also of giving with no expectations for return, just doing the right thing. Now, kids today don't have paper routes, but I learned an awful lot about business. Back then, I was Columbus Dispatch, the Wednesday Star, the Everyday Chillicothe Gazette, the Weekly Williamsport News, right on down the line. I had to buy those newspapers. I learned inventory control. Do you know how hard it is to sell a day-old paper? Hey, I didn't sell it. I learned about accounts receivables. I learned about collections. On Saturdays, all the kids out playing, I had to go collect that money. I found out what happens when somebody doesn't pay you. And then I also learned that some people didn't have the money, but they were good for it. They would run up maybe three months. But if I knew them, they knew me, yeah, well, I, got, I lost a few times, but that's life. You've got to take risk. So I learned about that. But also in that seventh grade, when my entrepreneurial business was really coming about, I was in church Sunday. I, can rem I, it, it just, I still remember it. I'm sitting out there in a pew right in the center looking right at the pastor. Right? He said, one of our young men, and I knew who it was, and I won't say his name, came to me this week, and he said, Pastor, is it okay to be a Christian and make money. And they said, I said to him, it's okay to make money as long as you don't leave God out of it. And right there, that moment, I said to myself, I want to be a businessman, I want to make money, but I'll never do it on the back of anybody else. I won't, I'll be ethical, I'll be moral, I won't lie, cheat, steal, and I will not do it when I get employees. I will not take advantage of them. I will not hurt them. I will do everything I can to give them a good life. I work hard at my employees. I want them to get up in the morning and say, 
I want to go to work. This is a great place to work. When they leave at the end of the day, I don't want them totally worn out. They have lives. They have hobbies. They, they have kids in, in sports. They should be able to leave work and not be totally exhausted. I think that's a part of a good job. And you know what? When they're there, they, they work. I don't want them to work them to death, but fully engaged in their job. Now, Einstein got to his special theories by imagining himself on the tip of an arrow. Now, he's writing that arrow. He imagined what happens when I approach the speed of light. Now, in theory, you cannot exceed the speed of light. But he took it to the next step. He imagined what happens when I am at the speed of light. Then he said, what happens once I go faster than the speed of light? Give an example. Who here knows what the Doppler effect is? It, it's great. We got some scientists, some engineers, some physicists. So the Doppler effect, you've seen it in the movie. The train is approaching the crossing. And it's going ding, 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 ding. It goes past the crossing, it goes ding, ding, ding. It gets lower and slower. That's the Doppler effect because if your speed relative to the speed of approaching, you're approaching, the waves compress so you get a higher, faster. As you're leaving, because of your speed against the speed of the sound, it stretches out, you get a lower and slower. Using science, using these basic ideas, simplicity to create ideas. Now, my employees... I t you know, they know, I, you know, I, look, I got more ideas than I got time or money, and I'm always going full speed with my hair on fire. Luckily, I've kept some of it, so that's a good thing. So my employees had the art department have me on the tip of an arrow with a whip yelling, faster, faster. And then several of the employees were hanging on the, on the arrow on the back with this look on their face and giving me that famous hand signal. I got the point. But as you're developing your business and, and use innovation and make the world a little bit better every day, have you ever put yourself in the customer's shoes? Do you have suppliers that just, they don't deliver on time. Part of what you get is broken. They don't do what they say what they would do. You don't like it. So be your customer. You know Christmas Eve when we had kids, you're up at 3 a.m. trying to put this thing together, you know, and, and the, all the parts aren't there. You go... Why, why doesn't this match the parts? And the English is like, the guy must have just learned to, to read and write English. That, that's not right. So, pretend you're the product. You're the product in the box. And the customer has to open the box. How are you packing it? Are you packing it so it won't break in shipment? Are you packing it so that the customer get to... I had a thing come in from Amazon yesterday. I thought I was going to have it get a chainsaw out to get to it. I'm going, Ew. All those little details, those little customer service, you create a competitive barrier. You start building your own little monopoly. So put yourself in your customer. Pretend you're the product. Pretend that I don't know anything about this product, and when I get it, how do I use it? Do I have good instructions? Do I have, do I have good videos on YouTube so that customers can go, boom, right there? Okay, I see how to do it. We still have printed instruction, but Eric is here back there. He's, he's our chief videographer. We have our own video studios. We make instructional videos. Okay, we do a lot of complicated temperature monitoring for vaccines, drugs, lab samples, and some of them are quite complex. So Eric's doing these videos, and how would you like to set through 35 minutes of detail, and you only need 20 seconds of it? So Eric broke it down. You can go exactly to the function that you want without watching everything else. Thanks, Eric. Now, conventional wisdom isn't. It's convention, it's politics, it's media. So whenever you hear, well, the conventional wisdom in, that's just like, well, we've always done it that way. Sure sign to take a hard look. Because if that's the way you've always done it, things change. Things change every day. Markets change. Customer change. Laws change. Rules change. People change. Great article in the 
London Financial Times a couple months ago, and it was talking about conventional wisdom. He, and he went through the exercise of every time it eventually is wrong. Just remember that. My employees will tell you, and I've got little plaques all over the place that says, creativity dies a quick death in rooms that house conference tables. I don't like meetings. I walk around. I talk to people. I try to get people talking to each other. Very important. Of course, they probably say I walk around too much and cause too many distractions, but that's the great thing when you own the place. You know, they, they got to put up with you. I remember that I got called into our VP of admin and HR, and I thought, oh boy, am I getting fired? Uh, I didn't remember signing the papers. All right, you can't do that. Have you ever been told you can't do that? All right, if, if you go, okay, I can't do that, we need to talk because I bet you can. That, that just, my employees know, don't tell Gary you can't do that. Oh, because we're going to have layers of complexity to work through to get to what he wants. Just think about it, of your employees, yourself, your members of your congregation. This is very important. We are most creative when we are most constrained. We don't, how many projects have you done that you've got all the money you need, all the people you need, all the resources you need, all the time you need? You don't. So you have to take what you have. You have to invent so we are most creative when we're most constrained because we have to get really imaginative. We have to get really innovative to make something happen. Let's talk about it's a leadership conference. Leadership and management go hand in hand. Here's the thing that causes problems with employees. Here's the thing that wipes out imagination, creativity, and innovation. For that, you can't see it. For those of you who were born after 1980, that's a port of john <laughs> Known as an outhouse because it used to set out behind the house. Known as a back house because it's back behind the house. That says management on the top, employees on the bottom. But I'll tell you what, in many businesses, that's management's attitude. That's not leadership. Don't do that. I actually have one of those uh, in one of the warehouses at our show supplier. I had it made, and it was a great big pharmacy show. So I, had, I changed it. It said pharmacist on the top, salesman on the bottom. They'd stop by, and they'd be standing there smiling, and I'd walk up, and you've always wanted to do that, right? And I'd go, you got to have a little fun. Life's short. All right, here's a big innovation killer. Here's a thing that really your employees and coworkers do not like. When you find someone in this situation, help them out. Please. You'll be better off. The business will be better off. Everybody will be happy, more creative, more innovative. There is a way to find it. That was Thomas Edison. Another favorite thing Thomas Edison said was, you know, I've been criticized for not being good at math, but let me tell you something. I can hire a mathematician. A mathematician cannot hire me. So you think about that. There is all kinds of expertise out there. Innovation, better management, better leadership. It's there. Think about it. Start practicing. Today, I'm trying to give you a way to think about innovating. And it's not just building a better iPhone, a better car, a better hardware or something. It's about every day in your life. And as we innovate, we're making the world a better place. Find a customer's pain. I teach our sales and service reps, 90% of sales is listening. Where are they having their problems? What are their problems? Watch the customer work. A lot of times your customers are, 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 are doing things. They don't realize it's painful. There's, it could cause errors, but they've always had to deal with it. They've never looked at it with fresh eyes. Remember, be the product, be the customer, be the system, be the service. So you see that now you're not just a salesman peddling something. You're in there solving the customer's problem. What we have found is once the customer says, can you please send the sales rep or one of your engineers or experts to our facility, we've got a problem. We think you can solve it. When they call us in, we got a 90% sales closure rate. But then what happens, it says, 
Can you come in again? Can you come in again? And you build that relationship because all sales are relationship. Here's another one. This is essentially how I built my business. Doing what no one else wants to do. Like, we'll do one-offs. We, we, we've become experts with CAD CAM manufacturing and, and other ways to build one or something. When I started in business, Larry watched me all those years. I started out right up here. The spare bedroom was the office. The garage was the manufacturing factory, was the, was the factory and the warehouse. So I, I, I built it. Well, now we got CAD CAM. We're doing some of the most fantastic things. I can deliver a customized stainless steel tray to, a, to an OR or sterile processing, to, to sterile compounding in the pharmacy for the same price, maybe even sometimes cheaper than a standard stainless steel tray that's not made to fit. Not made, being made to fit waste a lot of space. You ever, you ever go into the conference room where the conference room table is too big, too small, but that's what's standard, that's what fits. Same way on, on cabinets. You can have wasted space by putting in fillers versus making all the cabinets come out and fit with no wasted space. We saved one of the pharmacies up at Ohio State. We gave them 20% more working space simply by customizing everything and again seeing where there was wasted space and utilize it. Think different. Use your imagination. All right, life's tough. Now, if you're a golfer, USGA rules say you have to play the ball where it lies. All right, now, you don't want to hurt the turtle, but like, you know, put some pellets down, lead him over the hole, give him a little tap with your putter on the back, or are you, are you generous and you take your drop, you know, and, and your penalty stroke and move on. But life's tough. You're going to have to deal with employees that have problems, that have to be terminated if you can't fix them. Sometimes you can make lateral moves that solves the problem, but as you go through life, there are difficulties that you can't, haven't imagined before, but do an exercise like this and say, well, how'd the ball get there? That's number one. And then if I'm golfing, what do I do about it? And then, well, none of those, but I feel sorry for the turtle. How do I solve the turtle's problem? We're in the time of big data. Be very careful. Every day I get news feeds on health care from all over the world. New studies show. New studies show. There's a problem there. Recently it came out that your proton pump inhib inhibitors, your Nexium, that class of, of drug for, uh, for GERD, <coughs> gastric reflux. <coughs> University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, they've got millions of patients in, in their insurance and health care system. So with this new big data, they took 150,000 of their patients, ran it through big data and said, <gasps> people on proton pump inhibitors are 50% more likely to get chronic kidney disease. That's what the data show. Well, I'm suspicious, so I just start, you know, Winston Churchill, lies, damn lies, and statistics. I kept feeling away. So I, I get in there and it said, now, this was 17% of the patients who had taken proton pump inhibitors had chronic kidney disease. I read on, I read on, got into the fine print. In any population of 150,000 people, not taking a proton pump inhibitor, 15% have chronic kidney disease. Now, where did they come up with 50% more likely? I'm just saying, when you see statistics, start peeling away. Great article just a couple days ago in the London Financial Times. No offense back there, but politicians have destroyed statistics. And he went through David Cameron, Corbyn, Osborne, some of their leaders and how that here, especially with Brexit now, and I pay close attention. I have two businesses in England. And now they say, they didn't lie, but the guy went through and showed how it's not really true. Here was the news release effect. And sorry, you can throw things at me afterwards if, if you like, but this is, you, you just have to look up, look around, pay attention. I love this one. If you don't look up, and don't look around, you may miss the obvious solution. Now, that is the cockpit of a Boeing 777. I'm a pilot. 
and my employees know I'm a pilot, so about, I don't know, 95, 96, my employees got that for me as either a Christmas gift or a, a, a birthday gift. It's on my wall in my office here in Circleville. Now, there's something special about that, not just by me being a pilot. This was the first airplane designed with CAD CAM. All the design was computer-aided design. The manufacturing was done with CAM, computer-aided manufacturing, where the computerized digital design went to digital machines. So you could get constant repetitive parts exactly right without the skilled machinist making human human mistakes. Also in this software, first time you use software to do like a reticulating landing gear, it used to be they'd have to draw it, build prototypes to make sure everything collapsed right, angles were right, there was enough room. This software, you can articulate it. We've got software at our place, we can make things move, function. Fantastic. Then, they went to the pilots and said, what should the cockpit look like? That looks like no other cockpit. They do now. They've all gone the glass route. It's very efficient. Everything is in reach. The data is consolidated. Absolutely amazing. They went to the maintenance people. They had a whole list of gripes about maintaining an airplane. One of the biggest was if the exit light over the door went out on most planes of that era, it took about 40 minutes for a a certified airplane mechanic to change that bulb, and you can't fly unless that exit light over the doors is working. Bingo, fixed. Now it's like changing out a light bulb and a lamp at home. Little innovations like that take out costs, build a better product, make the world better. All right, that's the 800-pound gorilla. He sits in my office. He's a marketing, he's a market, the hat says so. He's a marketing genius. And, and you see on his arm there is a rubber chicken. Heads up! All right. I just want to keep you awake. So I like to have things around me. He's sitting, by the way, in, a, in an antique, the old-fashioned cast iron barber chair. Sometimes the girl I has to get out, I get in. Now, that's a Dell laptop computer. You ever want to do that to a, to a computer? <laughs> Come on. Delete doesn't work. Con control alt delete doesn't work. Escape button does it won't even turn off. Well, artist friend of mine, he just died last August from massive heart attack, God rest his soul. We were up at their studio. Actually we were going to get some of his wife, fine artist, we got a number of artwork. And I'm just admiring this and I'm admiring this and you know, so we got our artwork and and we, we were was with a friend, so Kate and Philip says, you know, could Gary and Connie have been good customers? Is there something we could do for them? Gary really likes that piece of artwork. Because Philip was a, a very famous wooden sailboat designer, furniture designer and builder. So they came and said, Gary, we appreciate your business. We're going to give this to you. It was fun bringing this through customs. It was down at St. Kitts. It's on my wall in my office, so I... It was kind of interesting. The rest of the story was, no, it was like $500. It had been there, nobody liked it, and here was all this other really nice artwork around, so said, we're going to give this to you. Well, they wanted, it turns out they wanted to get it out of the studio, so it, it was win-win. So getting that through custom, but anyway, you know, I like to have a little fun. I got it back in the office. I think it was Eric was in tech at the time. I said, Eric, I got a problem with my laptop. Come down here and I'm looking at you. Ooh, ooh. So he goes, I'm going to play some fun on one of my buddies. He says, man, Gary's laptop, I, I need you down here right away. So it's Ken Warner. Ken comes down. He goes, is it still under warranty? <laughs> All right, so he played with me a little bit. Got to have fun. Keep the mind open. Humor is a great way to innovate. Layers of complexity. I don't care what you do, they're there. Dealing with the EPA, dealing with the FDA, dealing with tax, dealing with engineering, dealing with congregants who have different ideas about how the church should be run. But use your imagination, innovate, make it better, make things grow. But you do, it, it is there. Be aware of it. Think about it. Work with it. I love this. I say it all the time. My employees are tired of hearing it. It's an old Russian proverb. 
When you're green, you're growing. When you're not, you're rot. Think about it. If you're not doing anything, not going forward, not going backwards, you're, you're rotting. Every day say, how can I move forward? How can I stay green? If it's working, keep doing it. However, keep trying to make it better. If it's not working, stop. Try something else. Approach it from a different way. Like you. What you did. Fantastic. It wasn't working. You had to try different things. What's the problem? What's the new definite? I, I remember that. You said what they were doing wasn't working. You try something else. Use your imagination. Be innovative. Now, you've got to put on a different hat. I'm not an accountant, but what if I were an accountant? Two before between the eyes. The mule that wouldn't go anywhere. So, guy comes up. Guy's trying to get his produce from farm to market. The mule stops. He needs to get there. Guy says, would you like me to get your mule moving? Oh, please. Guy walks over the ditch, gets two before, hits the mule right between the eyes. <clears throat> says, there you go. And the mule says, and they move on. The two before be between the eyes. The fighter pilot's helmet. Look at things from every direction. I do word games as I'm trying to create a new product, think of a new way to do something, a new way to sell something, a new way to market something, a new way to manufacture something, a new way to get people to talk to each other. Now, in the design engineering world, it's form follows function. It has to be functional first. I challenge that. Now, the perfect example is the iPhone. Steve knew what it wanted to look like and what he wanted to do, and he said to his engineers, work through the levels of complexity, innovate, create, engineer, let's do it. And they've continued to build on it. So. Let me tell you a story. I walk around. I like to talk to all my people. So I'm walking through our plastics, hand, uh, plastics fabrication place up in Grove City. New employee. Hi, what's your name? It's, it's Lacey. And fine. Well, tell me about yourself. Oh, I graduated from Ohio State with a Bachelor of Arts in Fine Arts. I'm, I'm trained in sculpture, painting, the full range. And, I've done some of this, done some of that, but I needed a real job. So she's in hand fabricating plastics. Well, of course, hand eye skills, right? So I go, I've done this before. HR. Lacey, talk to her, move her in with the engineers. Well, she's not an engineer. I go, she will make the stuff they design look good. Well, she has. She's done that. Turns out she's actually a pretty darn good engineer. She has come up with some very functional, creative ways to build things. How many of people that, that are around you have talents you don't know about? One of my engineers was about to be fired. He was working in, in tech services, IT. So we got to, you know, he's a nice guy. He just, and he's a pilot like me, and I said, just dig a little bit. He had built his own CNC machine, uh, uh, CNC machine. He was a virtual machinist. His garage was a, a virtual machine shop. And I said, would you like to move from tech? You're burned out. Go over here. Fantastic. It, it's amazing some of the things he, he's come up with, and he's happy, much happier. Look, you need a job you love. You got a job you love, you never work a day in your life. Very important. If, if it's a service business, what if you were the customer? What do you really want to do? What will make your service better? What will make your church better? What will make your food pantry better? What will make your university better? Define it, then start building it. You're working your way through layers of complexity. And remember, conventional wisdom usually isn't challenge it, challenge it, move on. Be bold. All right, let's, let's get to some of the heart of innovative thinking. The first cup man had was his hands. He'd scoop water up with it, right? Then, in, then we have clay pots became a cup. Now we have the modern-day coffee cup, tea cup. The one on the far right, mass-produced China coffee cup. The one in the middle, made by hand by an artist. The one on the left, 
made by hand from an artist. Now, how do you, you're looking at this, say, it's coffee cup. It's a good example of innovation, incremental innovation working through complexity. See the handles? Standard, factory made, the one in the middle, one of my favorite cups, handmade, artist design. Look at the color. You can use it left handed, right handed, looks good, great cup. Now, the one on the right, if, if you'll see it, it kind of swells out. I said, well, where's the handle? There it is. It's built into it. Now, you buy these in a left hand version and a right hand version. But you, there it is, left hand version. And it was designed by an artist up north who, in the mornings, wanted to keep her hand warm while she had her coffee or tea. Your whole hand wraps, wraps around. We don't have that problem too much in Florida, but I feel sorry for you. Now, left-handed cup, because I'm predominantly left-handed, but you can use it right-handed. It's neat. It looks good. It's functional. It's an example. Keep it in the back of your, line, in your mind. When you're, when you're confronted with something, you want to do something, you want to create something. If this were a coffee cup, how would I innovate it? How would I make it better? Now, some inventions, I'm in the medical field, some inventions are obvious. Okay, we got a couple artists here. Van Gogh, the expression does cut off his ear, right? So Van Gogh went, he actually did try medical school, but if Van Gogh came and he says, Gary, I need a special stethoscope. Oh, that's an easy problem to solve. Fixed. It's a, it's a cord untangler for EKGs, and EEGs. I was in a hospital in Hal Hobar, Saudi Arabia, up on the Arabian Gulf. I had a big meeting and, uh, you know, trying to solve the problems. At the end of the meeting, the head of the ICU said, Gary, you got a minute? I want you to come up to ICU. I got a problem my ICU nurses are spending way too much time on. Went up there and says, these, these 12 lead EKGs, EEGs, they're 12 lead, but they only have 10 cords. We won't go there today. He said, there, look, look at this mess that we're spending too much time. We've got critical patients. Come up with something. Back at the hotel that night, this was before email and, and all that, I sketched out, faxed into my engineer what I thought would work. By the time I got back, the drawings were done, and we immediately went to, to prototyping. It works. It's neat. You don't want to use it on IV tubes because you can camp, clamp off the flow. <laughs> That's not a good thing. All right, another good example of innovating in marketing, and some of my employees still think I'm nuts on this. I haven't fully convinced them. But back at the time, a, new, a couple new drugs came out. They were clot busters, TPA, streptokinase. They were about $250 a shot. They were in a pre-filled syringe, so if you're having a heart attack, a stroke, they can inject this to break up the clot. $250 bucks has to be refrigerated. So when they're in the refrigerators throughout the hospital, they're disappearing. Huh? That's not theft. It's inventory shrinkage. So, Gary, this is expensive. And not only that, it's not there when we need it. Can you give me something to lock up these expensive drugs in the refrigerator? Okay. So I designed this stainless steel top and a way to hook it. We, can, we, we, we probably have 40 models of this now, and we do custom. So we did all that. Now the... The red box is from stock. It's about $3 from Acro Mills up in Akron. The lock in there, simple little cam lock, about 3 bucks. So I went to a metal shop here in town. I didn't have my own yet. I said, here's my sign. Can you build it? I said, how many do you want? I said, 12. That'll be $125 a piece. So I got $125 and $6, $131. So we get them made, bring them in. It says, okay, we're going to market this. It's $131. What price do you want to put on? I said forty nine dollars. But 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 now wait. I had taken it one step further. Supplier said, if I buy a hundred, how much are they? He said twenty five dollars. This product was so successful, we had a competitor copied the picture in our catalog and put it in his catalog. Yeah, you know. They say imitation is flattering. Not so much when it's taking money out of your pocket. That's the greedy capitalist in me coming out. So, simple thing, change in marketing. That might not have taken off if I just tried to sell it for $189. So you got to, you know, look down the road. You know, the guy tracking the bear, the, the cat in, in the box. Just take it down the road. Take it down the road. Oops. 
Okay, hospitals now have these forty, fifty thousand dollar automatic drug dispensing machine. You have some areas you can't cost justify it. You can't do it. This is a, the metal cassette from Macro Mills is about thirty bucks. We, so, of course, sell all kinds of security seals. So you get yourself a little drill. You drill a hole in the top lip. You drill a hole in the plastic bin. Put a pull tight seal through it, and you have a very inexpensive automated dispensing machine. Kidneys. Now, about a year and a half ago, we've been very successful here. If you get a chance, come on down. We'll show you our short run, quick turn label printing operation. It's evolved into volume printing too, but we can turn around your labor order in a day if you really need it, but we, we promise five working days or less once you've approved the design. So there's nothing like this in England or Europe. So I said, I'm going to take this concept over there. Well, okay, we put everything in place. But you have to slit these down, slit and rewind, it's called. Now, the machine we have, we've got a couple of them. Nobody really liked them. They're $20,000. It's going to be $10,000 to convert it for, to uh, 110 AC to 220 AC that they use in Europe. Then another $5,000 to get it certified to, to run to, that it's safe and to run on their electric systems. So I'm going... You know, and we, I, it's a startup and the training issue. And I, I always had this idea. So I went to Brian, the, the, the fellow who was the pilot and, and was in tech. I said, Brian, I'm, I don't even have to draw. I'm just talking. He goes, I got it. I got it. I said, don't even put a motor on it. We'll have a hand crank. And we've got, I don't know, six, seven different types of labels. And the, the other machine, you've got to mess with those razor blades to reset it every time. I said, you know, can't we take that and have one for each size? So all you've got to do is unscrew this, slide the next slide in. You put, oh, yeah, we can do that. So got it done. He said, Gary, got the prototype gun. Come look at this. I go, what's with the electric gear? I said, that hand cranking got to be a problem. So somebody said, get a battery-powered electric drill with a flexible shaft. And you see see what holds the, the electric drill? You know, it's not expensive, but it works. We actually have a drill holder now. And so we took it to the label department and said, give it a try, give it a try. They didn't want to give it back. So we, we built new ones for them. They said, can you make it for our, for our big 9-inch rolls? Yeah, we did. Brian really outdid himself. He put an electric motor on it and everything. We're, we're going crazy with it. That's what you can do if you think differently. Look at it. Don't just do what they did. The reason I got in the label business is because they wouldn't run short. They wouldn't do short runs. They said, you might, you're going to, we're going to charge you for ten to 15000 even if you only want 100 or 1000 And you're going to get it in six to eight weeks whenever we decide to ship it to you. That wasn't good enough. So that's how I got in the label business. Fail fast, fail cheap. Miss Busters, no, last season, I'm, oh, what am I going to do? That's all right, I got the DVDs. Failure is always an option. You know, or I reject your reality and substitute my own. I like that one, too. I say this, the third one, all the time, my employees will tell you, I walk around, the year Babe Ruth set the home run record, he also set the strikeout record. Point, you've got to swing at the ball to hit it. Now, your employees try stuff, let them try let him fail. Turtle sticks his head out, you cut it off, he'll never stick his head out again. You know, try. Um, last year we had, uh, I'm involved with, uh, help start the Center for Innovation at Xavier University and involved in setting that up. And a whole bunch of the faculty and staff came up last summer. We did all the facilities, walked around. As we walked around, they'd take all levels of employees to the side and talk to them. So at the end of the day, I said, well, what do you think? And, you know, I said, well, you saw us talking to your employees off to the side individually. I said, yeah. I said, what did they say? This is something I'd like to know. He said, well, the first one said, well, you know, Gary, what you're doing here in this company is not in a textbook. I go, you're right. But my MBA at Xavier and my undergraduate degree, that was my foundation. And then I built on it. I looked, how do you do things differently? How do you do them better? Bingo. Okay, fail fast, fail cheap. I blew it on this one. There's my $500,000 mistake. 
I did Xavier MBA market research, everything they wanted. Good looking, not like something Frankenstein in the room or in the hallway. It's quiet. I'm in this game. Down the hall. Ever been in the hallway moving the cart down? It's clankety, clankety, clank. Sounds like a tank coming. Durable. All those things. I must have done something wrong. The sheriff showed up. <laughs> that app violated parole or something. I don't know. Big failure, classic failure, but you learn. I learned a lot. I went back, reviewed, and with my employees. Now, Ebola came along, right? Very contagious. Now, this came out of that cart. We've got our own thermoforming now. We're making tools out of wood. You can do it, knock out a tool in a couple days. Even that, depending on the complex complexity of the tool, it's out of wood. we got a cabinetry shop. One of the engineers, we go over there, they make these wooden tools. I can knock out one, I can knock out whatever. This sells for 99 bucks. So if there's an epidemic, these come flat shipped, boom, ready to go together. Now, you can either uh, sanitize it, disinfect it, and put it out in the waste, or you can t it, it goes together with plastic push ribbons. You can push them back out, take it apart, disinfect it, save it for the next time. Other market is, you had a little bit this year, you have big flu epidemics or, or food poisoning epidemic. They run out of beds. You've got patients on gurneys in the hallway. Where do you put their supplies? Bingo, 99 bucks. Keep a few in the warehouse. Call us. We'll ship them the same day. You'll have them the next day. That came out of that. A better, more inexpensive way to do thermoforming and make products for our customers that solve a problem. Talk to salesmen. Now, some salesmen aren't worth your time. But I'm a salesman. And I want to help solve my customer's problems. See, the king that day really should have talked to me. I could have made his life a lot easier. Future's not what it used to be. One of the neat things out of this book is you know we're really big and when we send a FedEx UPS package, where it is every minute, where it is every minute. We spend a lot of money doing that. Concept in this book, why spend that money? Why not just make sure it's there by 10 a.m. the next day at the right place, at the right time? Unique concept, isn't it? Doing it right the first time, eliminating a lot of cost. Yeah, well, that's me. Henry Ford, if you think you can or cannot do something, you're, you're right. Develop the weird part of your brain. My favorite story there is Henry Ford wanted a V8 engine. Engineers said, it is not possible to make a V8 engine. So he got tired of that. He called the engineers one day. He says, make me a running prototype of a V8 engine. He says, we told you, you can't do that. He says, you got six weeks to deliver or you're fired. Guess what? They developed the Ford V8 flathead as a high school kid working in the, in the filling station out at Williamsport. It's a neat engine. It still is. Winston Churchill, never, 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 never. I don't know what they paid him for that, but... He got a lot of money for his words. That was his whole speech. I use all kinds of things to get my imagination going. I like, I got some Scotsman Consultings, Mr. McCallum. He's one of my favorite. Um, a, a Frenchman, Mr. Davidoff. Cuban, Mr. Padrone. I read all kinds of magazines. I, I can't tell you how many products I've done on the back of an envelope or a, a, a piece of paper, a napkin. Start with a clean sheet of paper. You can look at history. You can look at development and say, hey, what is this I want to do? Start with that clean sheet of paper. You will be amazed if you put all the other stuff out of your mind. Whoops. Matrix stuff. Compare this to that. Finance against marketing. I, here's the four that I, I matrix most of the time. Make your own matrix. You can expand it. If you're really energetic, take a... Ruby Cube and put words on it. Oops. I've got a book for you. This was my uh, a paper I wrote when I was doing my MBA at Xavier. I had a really good advisor, Dr. Camille. He put me onto a lot of my research. I discovered a few years ago I had it printed because it worked. Everything I've told you today is from experience. It's from thinking, from reading, from doing. We've got a copy of it for you, or if you want, you can go to gogoinnovation.com go -go and you can download it as PDF. It works. And I'll tell you, you don't have to read it. Talk to people. Get people to talk to each other. It's amazing. It's not easy. Work on it. 
That's the website. That's the home page of gogoinnovate.com. I wanted something innovative. Thank you very much. My time's up. Heads up. You ready back there? <laughs>